Productions. Welcome to the Mad Life Podcast, where the chaos of everyday life meets the conquest of everyday dreams. Here is your host, Mad Clock. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Mad Life Podcast. This is episode three. Sorry, I took a little hiatus for a little while, but we are back. Scheduled programming. I have with me the awesome Patrick McElravey of Brittle Business Entertainment and Solo Project Seed. How you doing, brother? Not too bad, buddy. How are we doing today? Doing good. Uh, I definitely am happy I got to get you on the podcast because you, like myself, are a father, a working man, and a musician. So we're going to rock on those topics today. How you feel about that? Sounds like a plan to me. Cool. So uh, tell everybody that doesn't know you or isn't aware, new viewers and whatnot, a little bit about yourself and what you do. Well, no, I think your introduction there pretty much uh, summed it up there. Uh, family man, steel mill worker, uh, small business owner, active freelance musician, performer, recording artist. Uh, it's, yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty much it. And <laughs> there's not a lot of time for much else. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. He's, you always have a busy schedule, especially myself interacting with you on a daily basis. It's, it's uh, just, you got to schedule it in because we're always busy. Yep. Yep. So um, how long have you had the label under your supervision, I guess? Uh, we're going on a year now. Awesome. It's, How's it been? Uh, a lot of growing pains. Uh, been a, it's been a wild ride. It's been good. Uh, it's crazy because it feels like a year, but it feels like it's been way longer than that. Um, and at the same time, it's feel, feels like it hasn't been a year. Really, I don't even know where the past year went. It's, it's gone so quick. So many things that have, you know, just everything with COVID, even in general with COVID, with 2020, like I forget 2020 happened. Right. But at the same time, like five years worth of stuff was all condensed into 2020. Is just it's it's been crazy, man. Right. It's been a it's been a mad life, if you will. <laughs> very well said. Very well. Um, how has uh has like the experience of you know running a label basically and having that kind of responsibility has it affected your music at all? Do you think? I in the way that it's I, that's really hard to say because in many ways, shapes, and forms, I'm. Even outside of owning the company, um, I, I've been more musically productive than ever. Uh, and it, how I play, how I manage to get it all done, you know, with everything coming in and going out, feature projects I got working on, uh, it just, hey, you would think it would slow me down, but if anything, it's kind of put this like, okay, if I'm leading the pack, I have to, are you guys serious? Of course I would be doing this. My son would be going off. <laughs> uh, it's made me kind of want to set the bar. Like if I'm going to be run, you know, telling people what to do and, you know, putting out about putting out content and whatnot, I want to be the example. Right. Yeah. I, I feel from a personal perspective, you're setting the bar to a good pace too, because you're always putting out content and music, you're doing features constantly. Um, yeah. Touching on features, how is that compared to like doing your own music? Like, how do you, how's, how's that all for you? There's two different things to that because when I first started doing features, it was kind of like, and if somebody who did instrumentals would get a hold of me, or I would get a hold of them. So, like, I would write vocals for a whole song, you know? Uh, you know, when I first started doing it, I was like, yes, this is awesome. Somebody actually wants me on their shit. But as time kind of went on, and it's just like anything, uh, like I've written so much music in the last couple of years. I used to be really, really quick with coming up with lyrics on the fly, but you get to a certain point where you almost feel like you've said everything, used the different terminologies and analogies and metaphors and whatnot. It's to the point like I have, like, it, it takes me a minute now to write, you know, good, and I pride myself on my lyrical content. It takes longer than it used to. But nowadays, I kind of prefer just to do a verse or do the hook. I mean, uh, I don't mind doing a whole track. You know, that's always fun, especially if, you know, I'm really digging the song. But typically, I, I like hooks the most. Hooks are the most fun, I would have to say. For sure. Um, you're 
one of your latest ones being actually with me, Shadowville. Yeah. How how was that for you? That was actually really fun. Well, it was nice because you gave me a format. You had the lyrics written out. You sent me a track with, where you pretty much just showed me sort of the placement of how you wanted the lyrics. And I, uh, you kind of told me where to go vocally, but you left the ball in my domain and started messing with it. And just, that's, that's the fun part about creating. You know, when you have ideas like that and, like, you can hear it, but whenever it starts to come to fruition, it, it, it's just like, holy crap, like, we're really on to something here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because at first I started out with doing fry screams and I was like, okay, well, like that's cool, but this really isn't like a heavy, heavy track. There has to, in my mind, there has to be some kind of melody. And then I ended up doing the, the harmonies and whatnot. It, it just, it, like, I was really, really like, as, as the juices were flowing, you know, it was just really, really exciting. You know, I, I didn't, I, honestly, you, you threw me a loop with the harmony that you threw in there. And I was just like, took a moment, like, Ah, oh, it totally belongs there too. Like it never. Yes, yes. I, I just thought just your regular screams, and when you hit the first, I I think Tara yeah. was sitting next to me. I was like, I never expected that, and I fucking love it. Holy shit, blew my mind. Love it. Yeah, it's, it, and it was an accident too. Uh, I meant to do. Uh, what was I doing whenever that happened? I think I was just either going. To, I think I was supposed to be doing like a double up of one of the takes mm -hmm. but i ended up singing higher on accident and then like i went back and i listened and i'm like oh i gotta show nate this this actually i think is pretty cool and we, were both, <laughs> we were both stoked on it we just kept building from there with it yeah that's uh one of the funnest collabs i've done because the energy of the back and forth you know what i mean is just oh yeah I I usually write in person with somebody and I, I've done very few collabs like faith and did one with me, but we wrote in the studio together and that's the kind of the prefer preference I have. I've never done too many features because a lot of it's been over and I always felt for the longest time, like you just couldn't obtain that kind of energy over an email. You know what I mean? But uh, obviously you and I connected pretty early on in our conversating anyhow. So, I mean, I think just a click was there naturally. Um, so the emails probably felt more personal than, and than ever before. So it probably helped on my end. Uh, but it was just like you and I were in the studio together, even though it was just emails and files sent back and forth. It was like you and I were the same page, knew what we wanted. And yeah, yeah, this yeah. song is incredible. It, it, that, that song was just a really good example of the magic of what creating music is all about. The hype. Right. And yeah. Right. And to, and to be able to do, and that's why I love doing episodes for this podcast. It's like being able to create something like that amidst work kids stress the other stuff you know a lot of guys or um just artists in general that have all the other stuff going on just can't focus enough and they lose their path and they lose get distracted by all the other aspects of life it's really cool to still be able to deal with all that and create an amazing beautiful piece of music you know it's heavy and um i don't think it's very vulgar i think i may be swearing it once at the end uh i think i went pretty clean with that one but it's it, regardless. It's just it's a it just feels like a beautiful piece of music to me. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. E everything, everything about it from the flows you did, the instrumental piece. It had like a nice little dark trap vibe with with some cool melodic nuances and whatnot. And then yeah. just the way the way you set the hook up for me to come in and just how how we ended up laying everything out. Just, I'm a I'm a huge sucker for big drops and I really love that too when you're like your glitch your glitch core solo project yep. teeth and that's uh yeah. just it's it kind of worked out that way as soon and I realized that you do a lot of the same stuff um stylistically on beats as when it drops it's and you just go nuts. You know what I mean? Just it's really cool again to provide that slam then the then the uh the vocal kind of synth hits and you just tear this shit up. It's great. Very grassy ass for uh like adorning what? my track <laughs> that was really cool anyway moving on start talking about us the entire time um uh compared okay so 9sm is your other project you have nine stitch method yeah so i mean you primarily write all the lyrics for that and you know what i mean do it all correct uh yeah pro yeah primarily i write the lyrics um we have uh we have one track um, it's honestly one of the ones that people talk about the most. Uh, it's the very last track on Jay Walking on the Bullet called The Fear is What Keeps Us Here. And that was actually a song 
that was from Josh's old band, uh, 5 a.m. at the funeral home. And that was my, whenever we started playing shows with them guys, oh, bloody hell, that had to have been back like 2015, 2016, uh, when I was in Song the Chronicles. I heard that song and like, I, I loved it. Me and Josh weren't even talking about, like we had just met and, you know, checking out each other's music and whatnot. And I heard that song. And I'm like, dude, this guy is like a good guitarist and a good songwriter. And like I always told him, like, that was my favorite track. And then as time went on, Slumber Chronicles disbanded, 5 a.m. the funeral home disbanded. And, you know, Josh and I were full fledged doing 9SM uh, <clears throat> and getting that going. We were working on, we did a, we did an EP. We did an album. We recorded completely ourselves. And then we were working on Jaywalking, where we first brought Gus Wallner, our producer, into the mix. Um, we were trying to, like, we wanted to write something big and epic. And I'm like, I kept telling him, I was like, I want a track like uh, The Ghost the ghost Inside, I think is what it was called. The Ghost in Me is You. It was something like that. Um, we kept trying it. We just, I was like, you know, I was like, maybe you should reach out and just see if we could use that song. And I'll just write all, you know, like, we'll keep, because Josh wrote the hook to that, and he sang the hook, you know, and that's what's still in the song to this day. Yeah. And I was like, let's keep the hook. The hook is amazing. The song is amazing. Let's just see if I can just rewrite the other lyrics and, you know, get my parts in there, and then we'll see what happens. And, and dude, it turned into a friggin' banger. We Every show since we wrote that, we've always closed with that song. Nice. Um, and every time anybody listens to that song, they hear Josh singing that hook. They're like, who is that? I'm like, a boy on the guitar singing. And they're like, who's the voice of an angel? I'm like, I fucking know. Tell him so he can sing it. Give me more of a break. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, man. It come out beautifully, beautifully. Hell yeah. Awesome. Um, do, you, do you feel like you write differently for 9 and 7 than you do for your C's stuff? Uh, you know, de definitely. Um, whenever I'm trying to think of something good that explains it. Okay, so, oh God, this is going back. Okay, so we're going to go back to like 2011. Uh, when Stain come out with their last album, they had a documentary. And Aaron Lewis is in the studio. Now, at this point, he's doing Stain and he's got his solo country stuff on the side, right? Yeah. But they're in the studio, they're in production, they're recording the album. And he's on a time crunch to write the lyrics and record the lyrics to finish out the album. Well, he's trying to come up with lyrics to one of the songs and he can't do it, can't do it. He grabs the acoustic guitar, boom, write the country song right on the fly. And he says, like, I've been trying to write this angry, aggressive song, but this was floating around in there. I can't access that until I get this thought out of there. Right. And that's a lot. And that's a lot of times what happens to me because at this point in time, I have Steve, I have Nine Stitch Method. Um, Just and I finally just released our uh, album, Soft the Clarity, Beyond Definition. Uh, and I also sing for the Marion Drain Project too. And plus, with all the features and collabs and stuff I do on the side, it, it, it's just a matter of where my headspace is at. Right. There's times I know I need to write for this project put my head's over here. I think that's right. honestly the biggest, the most daunting task of it all. Right on. Um, so <laughs> even, even as your features, are you featuring as Seath or Patrick McElravey or like, or is it, is it? Right now, I just have it going under Seath okay. because it just makes sense for me that way. For for a while there, um, it was under Patrick McElravey, but considering I have the solo project and the moniker, it's best just to do it that way to help. It's a Right. Yeah. yeah. That um, flows off the tongue a lot better than Patrick McElroy, So Right, right. It's short, sweet, to the point, one word, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it's kind of like Mad Clock as well. It just gets kind of like, it's awkward enough when you say it out loud. It's like, that's kind of weird, but you wouldn't really forget it because it's kind of unique. You know what I mean? In a sense. It's kind of what I was going for, too. So it works. Um, I, uh, One thing I did want to talk about, uh, you were on like a small just uh, group tour uh string of shows long enough to be called like a mini kind of a tour. Oh yeah. We, yeah, we did a little, little stint with feast on the fall and back in 2019. That awesome. was fun. 
Yeah, so uh, I've never toured, I guess, per se. Uh, I had a small a small string of shows that were, you know, pretty months months in, in a row with uh, my first project, Two Stupid Dogs. I uh, was mostly around uh, Erie and, you know, surrounding areas. But I've never gone, like, state-to-state state touring in a string of shows. How was that? Um, you know, because you had had kids at that point, you know, married and all that stuff. So, like, how how did, how did all that work? It, it, was, it, was, it was really fun. Um, whenever you're, you decide to make that trek and take that step to go on tour, um, you learn really quickly how well uh, your bandmates uh you learn how well you really, really actually mesh when it can find space. Because, uh, like, for that, hell, we went from Pittsburgh to, hell, even just, like, the first show was in Huntington, West Virginia. That, that was, like, a five-hour drive, five-hour yeah. drive. I can't remember how long it was. But, it was, you know, but we were, we were there. Um, we, uh, yeah, we stayed at the promoter's house that night. Then we went from there to Nashville. We were in Nashville a couple nights. Uh, we went to Gatlinburg. We were supposed to go out to New Orleans, but that didn't just stuff beyond our control happened, and that didn't happen. Uh, I wouldn't call it like a full like it wasn't like really a tour. It was more of like a little weekender to spread out over a week. But uh, even just the long driving and being crammed up in, in a van and whatnot. Um, like for example, <clears throat> like I've known the guys to be on the phone for uh, well, my daughter's stuff, and so. Yeah, a little over seven years. Mirrors now I know them, you know. Um, yeah. Very, it, it's funny because I am very laid back. Uh, I'm not really much of a partier. Like, whenever I party is whenever I'm at the house in my comfort zone. Right. And I don't have to worry about driving. Yes. Whereas, like, <laughs> I never seen boys so excited to walk up and down the Nashville Strip and drink tea to the yard all night. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we, went out, <laughs> we went out all, we went out the first night um we were out to four o'clock in the morning i kind of stayed sober just because being in a social setting like that with a bunch a lot of people just made me uncomfortable you know i didn't want right. to get fucked up and you know get, get broth or whatever you know oh yeah yeah i kind of looked we looked look me and uh pat 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 yeah me and pat from peace and paul and kind of looked at out after everybody and herded everybody back to the B&B at four in the morning. Yeah. Uh, and then, like, the next night come, uh, that was our show, actually, the second day we were there. And we played our show <laughs> with the Crying Wolf, and they wanted to go out on the town again. And I, I was just like, oh. I looked at yet. I, I didn't say anything to Josh. You know, just kind of as the night was going on, I'm like, bro, I just want to go back to the hotel room and chill. Maybe have a couple of drinks and just pass out. He's like, dude, yes, me too. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we're, me, me and Yeti are both just pretty chill like that, you know. We're, right. we're kind of keeping it easy and whatnot, you know. But it, it was a yeah. fun time, though, man. It was, it was a good time. Awesome. So, it, it, for overall, overall went pretty well then. Yeah, yeah, yeah overall, yeah. dude. I right think on. really, like, I would, like, I, if I had the money and the capabilities, I mean, obviously, we, we, we were having plans to go back out on the road with them guys, but then COVID happened, you know? Right. Uh, I think before, and, like, me and Randy were talking a couple months ago about it, you know, like, things shout happened. Out Ran- shout out Randy Cole. Yeah, right, yeah, shout out to Randy Cole. He's the man. You know, before we even think about getting into that like things have to be pretty normal for a little bit before we put the time and energy and money into that but oh yeah yeah definitely um yeah it's a blast i think the hardest part for me was like i did start even though we were only going like five six days like i did start to get a little homesick but i think if we had more shows to do you know i think i would have made a little bit of a difference you know because like like i said we didn't we were supposed to go out to New Orleans, didn't happen. So, like, it was kind of like, man, like, it feels like kind of like a mini vacation without my family, you know what I'm saying? But, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but. Yeah, I just never, you know, I've always been curious about doing a tour. And Tara's very supportive. Mom, Mad Clock, shout out to Mom, Mad Clock. Uh, very supportive and was, you know, said, yeah, if, you know, if it ever happened, do you think, cool. 
So I was just talking to various artists who have done smaller tours that kind of have experienced things that, you know, it's, it's enough to think on that. I feel like I'd be a little more prepared when that time came for me. So, yeah. yeah. yeah but, um, definitely bring plenty of stuff to shower, plenty of clothes. Right. Uh, I think probably the hardest thing for me in that kind of environment, because I am somebody who, it pisses me off because there's people I see that treat their voices like shit, don't even warm up, drink, smoke. They just go up on stage and they sound amazing. Yeah. Where I have to eat a light breakfast and then, you know, I have to go, I have a warm up regimen I have to go through. You know, I don't drink carbonated beverages after a certain time I'm doing my water intake. You know, I have to baby it, you know, and then, uh, yeah, so like in that kind of environment, you know, you want to make sure you get enough sleep and whatnot, but, you know, when you're on the road, you know, you want to go out. Like we were in Nashville, like we want to go out and see everything in Nashville. I mean, so, yeah, it's just, it's definitely interesting. It, it takes you out of your element, but at the right. same time, you're in your element because that's what you're working for. You know? Right, right. Well, I, I admire the level of dedication you have to your voice in particular. And over the last, I'd say at least a year, I've been at least researching and then um, doing different things to kind of keep my voice healthy. Uh, I pretty much stopped smoking cigarettes for the last two years. But I mean, I get... I, I like drinking, so I drink once in a while and have a couple of cigarettes, whatever. But I mean, consistently smoking it, definitely not in the last two years. And that's helped, I think, the depth of my voice and uh, my endurance a little bit as well. Oh, yeah. um, sure. But uh, sure. other things that also, and that I find myself doing the same thing where I know, okay, tomorrow I'm going to start recording. So, you know, I'm going to do this. I don't drink any sodas. You know, I don't drink any milk, especially um, lots of lukewarm water or warm water. And then I make my ginger tea like it's. I've always made this routine and mindset that once I get into recording and doing something vocally, it's I so I I I feel you on that. I've been babying myself as well. But yeah, um, that's super. <laughs> just little nuances that you know different musicians have to do, like rituals or whatever. It's just all and that's crazy. I've seen people. My guitarist, my old band, he would just get shit hammered, man, and he would just play these songs almost flawless. I'm just like, how? Yeah. The- I'd be, I, I speed rap. I can't like drink too heavy before a show. I have my I buddies always trying to party. They're like, bro, let's do shots. I'm like, I will do one and that's it. I, cause I, I can't slur. I'm like, blah, 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 blah. you know, I can't do that. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll do a couple shots at most. Yeah. Of, like, center. Tar- yeah. Uh, get loose. Tar- yeah. yeah. Just to kind of chill the nerves off. But like, I can't, right. I can't get fucked up. I, I watch dudes do just sit back whenever I play guitar. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't get messed up and then get up, get up and rock it on stage. I'd be a sloppy mess. Yeah, yeah. It's some guys can do it, I guess. I mean, Nikki yeah. Six. I don't. I mean, we all know how badass that man was doing whatever he wanted and being a god at it. I mean, not all of us have that capability. I'm not yeah. one of them. I've never been one yeah. of them. Like yeah. I used to just super fucked up and drink all the time. And it's, even when it came to music, I just I cared enough that I knew I'd be shit at it when I did it. So I didn't want to do it that way. You know what I mean? It's, I cared enough that I took myself from being that. You know, and you're the same way. I just don't – you don't want to do that. You know what I mean? Personally, yeah, you don't want to do that. Even, even when it comes to writing and whatnot, um, right. I've never been one to try and get blitzed or anything. And, you know, right. Right, like, to me, like, I, you know, I want to clear your head. You know, I right. want to be able to see the vision for exactly what it is and then try right. concrete exactly what it is. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, any any new stuff that you can think of, like going on? Oh, well, let me think here. Let me think here. Uh, well, like I just said recently, uh, me and Guster, our little project off the Clarity, we finally dropped our album, uh, Beyond Definition. It's a collection of tracks that him and I have worked on over the years. Uh, he was actually like him and Yeti both really really molded me on this journey as a vocalist because i haven't really been doing it that long i mean well not since it's been around for five years now so that's how long i've been doing it um but working with gus kind of helped me take it to the next level because i was like oh like i'm working with somebody else like i don't want to look like a complete dipshit like i don't know what i'm doing right right uh, but, but like gus's music a lot of it is a lot more melodic than what 9sm does so that kind of 
not that I'm necessarily a cr crazy singer or anything, but like that helped kind of help shape and push the melodic aspect of my voice. Right. Uh, Gus did a really good job on Shadowville too. Let's shout out Gus Walner, by the way. Uh, you think music? If you get a chance, go like, subscribe, check out that page. Guy is always working. I've it's one of the most impressive outputs of content I've seen from anyone in a long time. Dude, it's insane mad. what that guy does. He's a madman. I'll give him there's some weekends I know, like I've given him nine stitch method track. Now, whenever we give him a nine stitch method track, we give him like a kind of like a layout for how we kind of want the drums. Uh, we give him the guitars. We give him the vocals. Uh, he writes the bass, does the drums, mixes and masters the shit. And we'll have rough demos for multiple songs over the course of a weekend while he's mixing and mastering for other artists and writing and recording his own stuff for his channels. And it's just like, not, and, and not to mention, I, I, the, People down in Brazil, they get down. Like, dude, block parties every day, barbecues, pool parties. I don't know how the man does it. You know, and he's got a nine to five job too. He's got he's got two right. little girls and a wife. Yeah. You know, like, I, crazy. I would love crazy. to have him on this podcast. That would be super cool. You should absolutely. He's, he's been yeah, because he was up here in the states back in the early aughts. Like he used to be good friends with like people that work for like mud vein and you know a lot of them early 2000s bands you know he's got a yeah. lot of really cool stories that's yeah. super cool i uh finding myself around more and more people that have experienced you know this slightly upper echelon of experience with other musicians and higher level artists and it just constantly like blowing my mind and inspiring me at the same time you know what i mean yeah. um yeah. when was yeah. your first uh if you've had one um kind of like starstruck moment in person uh, starstruck hmm. i would say probably the first time like i really well what what, what, what do you mean by starstruck so I answer okay, okay yeah like uh working with and or meeting uh like a huge uh, someone you're a huge fan of, I guess, just being like, wow, um, I'm really talking to this person. Like, what? Honestly, uh, even though I really didn't talk to them, I'd say, like, <laughs> they opened up for a national act. I would say that was kind of a moment. It was a packed, it was a packed house, a lot of people. Um, yeah, because the first time I ever opened up for a national act, I was still in on guitar for an old band called Divine Betrayal. And we opened up the Star Set and Gemini Syndrome with uh, the Art of Burning Bridges. That was the other one who opened her, wow. at the Rex Theater in Pittsburgh. And it was sold out. And it was right before we went up on stage to start our set. I went up to go to my guitar, make sure everything was good. And everyone's out in the crowd packed wall to wall and i was just like i waved and everybody was like yeah and i was like i had my phone and i was like this and everyone was like yeah and everyone went nuts i was like holy crap like i never thought i'd ever play in front of a crowd this big uh start uh, um an interesting starstruck moment would be something i just did recently uh there's a newer act called blood of the coven or Oh, Topher, I'm sorry, dude. Blood of the Blood of the Coven? I think that's what it's called. I'm sorry, Topher. Shout out to Blood of the Coven, even mm -hmm. if I'm saying it wrong. No, nah, but I, I got invited to play on a their thing on a like a scream rap cipher. And it's got a lot of small names like me. And you know, a bunch of my other friends and stuff, you know, that I know throughout the music community online. Uh, then there's some like bigger names like Kid Crusher and Jade the Nightmare and whatnot. Like that was pretty cool. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, I, <clears throat> I I never I have talked to Jade a couple times off and on. Uh, she's really cool down to earth. Cool. Uh, Kid Crusher, I've never I've been a fan of his music, but I've never talked to the man in person. But right. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Sometimes like holy crap, how did 
did I land that? You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Um, yeah. I, I, crazy side story before I get into uh, the more of that conversation. Uh, when I was, I want to say 19, maybe 18, I was working for a landscaping company in New York. And it was like a gated community, right? Yeah. So uh, higher end, richy kind of neighborhood, gated community kind of stuff, you know, and uh, it's mowing lawns, doing weeds and whatnot. And uh, I shit you not, Sully Erna pulls up in the driveway. Yeah. And I was like, you got you to be kidding me. Well, it's a summer home in Mayville, New York. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, I was just like, man, what do I do? I'm mowing his lawn. I'm just like some fucking dude in a, you know, in a, in a lawn crew. You know what I mean? Just do it like, uh, was, so he went in the house and I was like, all right, I probably missed my moment. Like, but I saw, I, you can't you recognize him immediately. So I from yeah. Godsmack, duh. So, uh, mowing his lawn and I like tried to keep towards the front of the house to see if like he would come back out and I didn't for a while. I'm like, all right, well, I can't mow the same area forever. <laughs> so I just like went to move on and sure enough, it comes out of the house. So I like slowed down and he gets by his car and I was like, so only Erna kind of like turned and my short little ass, he looked like right over me. I was, well, what's up, man? So good, dude. Uh, huge fan. Like autograph, man. And he was like, yeah, maybe later, man. I got to go. Got this shit left. Like, it's a summer home. You don't want to be bothered. Like, I can't even be a dick about that. You know what I mean? Like, whatever. He's probably not like a huge. Maybe I caught him on a bad day, whatever. But that was that was super cool. Uh, that was the closest I think I'd ever been to, like, someone, like, super famous. So it was super dope. Um, but I think you and I also have an opportunity together to experience kind of a really cool higher level moment. We're opening up for Twisted in October. That's exciting and very very nerve-wracking at the same time. Yes. Uh, I mean, yep. Well, like, I, I've kind of... Because doing the Steve stuff, first is, like, 9SM, like, I have somebody else up there with me. Right. You know what I mean? But, like, when I've done the Steve, that's, like... You know, I get up there, I do my thing. But, like, I have that much more anxiety because all eyes are here. There's right. nothing else to take the attention off of me. So, and, and another thing, like, it was before I played my first show, Bloody Hell. I had two EPs and two albums recorded for this project. Yeah. And I never played any of them live. And holy hell did I do myself dirty in the way I wrote them songs. <laughs> were... Hard to do live. Oh, my God, dude. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I'll, I'll be real with you. So, like, when I was getting ready for my uh I played up in – up uh, toward Clarion in the Clearfield area, a couple that would have been last month. No, I was getting ready for that show, and then we started getting talking about getting nine stitch method rolling out. That things are going back to normal. So I did a Steve set up in my attic earlier in the day. I was like, "Hey, my voice is probably going to be shit because I practiced already." But come over and practice. Let's get it. You know, we're going to do it. Let's do it. And dude, I breezed through that nine stitch method set. It was so much easier than anything I've done with Steve. I was just like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little break. Yeah. You, yeah, just, so, you just hadn't realized it was going to be that difficult at all. Yeah. Yeah. Because, well, I, I you know, it's self inflicted because right. I, I go through, I've added more techniques and stuff into my arsenal over the course of COVID, you know, just messing around right. with vocals and whatnot. Right. I never really planned on playing this stuff live. Uh, and it, so, like, I was just, I figured, bloody hell, just go for it. We'll throw all these different techniques, make it real diverse and cool and whatnot. And then shows started popping back up. I started getting asked. And I was like, oh, my band isn't ready, but I can probably do a solo set. And they're like, all right, well, let me hear your solo set. And they're like, that's fucking dope. Come on out. Play a set. I'm like, all right. And then I started practicing, and I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) what the hell did I do? Yeah, what did I do exactly? So. That's going to kind of dictate how I write some of these tracks in the future. Make right. it a little easier on myself, at least. Yeah. I, I found that myself as well. Um, coming from, even as like, okay, it was a duo project as the acoustic thing. But yeah. all the vocals were on me and some some I played guitar for, some I didn't. I found and realized that I can kind of go vocally a little stronger without the guitar in my hand and have to like sit in one spot. So it was, it was nice to kind of be free. But something that kind of always told me I wanted to be able to perform 
the track as as accurate as possible live than I did on recording it. So I, as you know, avoided that kind of conflict, trying to keep it in mind. But as I've been getting faster, I'm sitting here telling myself, okay, well, you kind of have to reinvent that implementation and make sure you can still do it live. You know what I mean? It's, it's literally just holding my breath on for dear life because I may be able to be fast at it. Cool. But if I don't have enough breath, I mean, it's, it's going to fall apart at some point. So that, it, that's the, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You just, it's finding those stupid little things. So like, what if, what have you found that helps to kind of get through those moments of like this, this part really sucks. Um, I've kind of gotten to a point with my voice where, I know about where I'm going to be able to be live. Like, for example, like if I'm doing, say I'm doing a, like a collab with you, for example, versus one, like I'm doing with Caleb from uh, MZNZ, you know, he's all the way down in Austin, Texas. The chances of me and him ever actually getting together and playing that song are highly unlikely. Maybe it'll happen. Hopefully. But so I'm going to write my track for you more geared toward me being able to do it live right. than I am for him. I'm right. going to go ball to the wall with his track. Oh, yeah, right. You know, so it, that's kind of the mindset I go into it. Um, if I'm doing a feature, um, but like in them, like I said, in the, in them, and it, too, like I don't use all the same techniques that I do in the, stu- in the recorded version versus live. A lot of times my studio vocal is strictly fry and glottal compression. And I can do it live, but considering how active I am on stage as a performer and I chain smoke like a motherfucker, um, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, my lung capacity goes pretty quick. Uh, so, it, and with all the running around and there, you know, there's a lot of finesse to that technique. So right. typically when I'm live, I stick to false chord and guttural screaming. Okay. It's just easier to project and whatnot. It's not as, you know, and it's louder too. Like that, the false chord and whatnot's always been easier to, you know. But I like the fry right. technique. I like I like my sound there a little bit more. Right. But yeah, um, yeah. I just know, like I like whenever I start working things into practice and whatnot, you know, like I just run through it back to back to back. And I'll be like, okay, like these are the moments where I was struggling. Maybe I'll tweak how I do the vocals here. Maybe I'll just sing. Maybe I'll just kind of run or shout or you know whatever right i try to be as prepared as possible going into a show as i can right for where i'm going to be at vocally so um touching back to kind of the mad life monikers that i'm i'm instilling in this podcast for people that are struggling or may may be experiencing similar things the dedication and time you've taken to develop your voice as far as you have which in my opinion is amazing it's so saturated it's clear it's a, it's a great sound. You've been working at it for a long, long time. Um, the support at home is obviously super important for that because it allows you the time to go in the attic as you know, I know that you call it the attic. Um, yeah. I still think you have to do an album called the attic tapes or something, bro. It, it just sounds badass. But it, I, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, yeah. So, uh, the, the give and take of, yeah, okay, I have the kids here so I can go to this. And, and you know, even me right now, Tara has my children so I can do this podcast with you, the support at home. Um, how, the give and take of that, man. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. For what, you've, the, what you've experienced. Over the years. So I've been, I've been in bands for like 10 years now. Uh, when you have a significant other, the most important thing you can do, and this is something I struggle with now and then, but I've so much better you know I, plus i'm older too you know i'm not as dumb and stupid as i used to be right but communication 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 um you know if you, whenever you're wanting to practice whenever you know hey like i'm setting up a gig for this day you know let's mark it down do we have anything going on that day we uh <clears throat> whenever i play you know oh whenever i know somebody hired me for a feature i have a deadline you know, you know, set up these, you know, make, make sure, you know, I let them know, you, you know, you let your partner know when, when you're going to be doing this stuff. You know what I mean? Right. right. Because if you don't, one, they feel left out, uh, you know, and then like, it just makes life in general complicated because, you know, your missus or mister, you know, they could be planning on 
going to the zoo or something with you that day or setting up a shindig with somebody else for a party. Yeah, yeah, just all kind of stuff. The communication. Right. I, I feel that's a lot of the issue that people have. I know I that, was, uh, that was a self-inflicted issue for me. I'm um, there for, you know, whenever I was younger and just kind of getting into this. You know, um, you have to take your partner into consideration. Uh, right. The same thing with the kids, you know, when you have kids and stuff too. Um, it, it's a lot to juggle. But if you, you know, if you have a partner that is supportive and, you know, understands and, you know, is backing you, you know, you want to, you know, you want to make sure, you know, that, you know, communication they're in the know and what's going on and for sure. you know, be, be respectful about it. That's the biggest thing in my opinion. about that. Absolutely. Uh, shout out Becca, by the way, she's a cool ass woman. She's Becca super dope. Is- yes. Um, Puts so, up with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, both our women do. So I always acknowledge a woman that puts up with a maniac of a man that's trying to do something in this insane business we're interested in for some godly reason. Well, they stick by us. Well, like even like I'll be real with you, and this is going to sound weird. I don't know how it is for a lot of people, but I do shift work. Right. Honestly, like I do, I find that I get more done from a creative and recording aspect when I'm on night shift, which that's whatever for me. <laughs> it fucking sucks for her. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Oh, well, you, I'll, I'll give you the rundown of my day. Okay. So say you hire me. Okay. I'm like, all right. So I'm at work all night when you give me the music and whatnot. So I'm bumping that all night. All my right. juices are going. I'm writing yep. my lyrics when I got spare time and everything. I'm like, okay, I got everything. So I'm working all night, six to six. So I get home. I get to bed about seven o'clock, fall asleep. Typically, I wake up around noon, so 45 minutes to an hour to, you know, wake up a little bit, warm up a little bit, you know, get things loosened up, you know, try to wake yep. up and be, so, okay, we're at 1 o'clock now, one thirty. All right, babe, we got a feature. I'm going to head on up to the attic. So that's at least an hour and a half, two hours there. So yep. now we're at 3.30, come down. Maybe grab some lunch, chill out a little bit, maybe do some dish to do some laundry, whatever. And then five o'clock, I got to head out the door to go to work. That happens a lot. That's just how it is. Right, right. Uh, yeah. So, but that, that goes back to that communication thing, you know? Like, right, right. Because while I'm doing that, which that's, you know, that's awesome. Yeah, he's being a rock star. He's doing his shit. Right. You know, she's taking care of the kids. Right. Letting the dogs out. Moving the dishes, cooking supper, making sure I got clean work clothes. You know, yeah. She's Super the MVP. woman. Oh yeah, exactly. absolutely. Exactly. So, in in the spirit of thinking of our ladies, because uh, I I try to make sure this is done as well, and I'm sure you do too. Or else, you know, woman wouldn't be too happy. What do you feel that you know you do for her that to thank her? Uh, the, because we're pretty good men. We take care of our women. We take care of our kids. We have jobs. We do the we do the shit, you know what I mean? Um, the time taking out surprises ain't like that that you just do for her to be like, all right, this is for you know putting up with my shit for a while, <laughs> you know, just doing something special for your lady because that is very important as well for guys that don't know listening. Oh uh, yeah, I mean we're not exactly good at it because we always are on the run doing stuff. Like right. for example, like we just finished up cheerleading gymnastics. Uh, for Lorelai, like we always have something going on, but right. typically just taking them out for the evening, no kids, you know, make sure you're giving them the attention they deserve. Right. Uh, a lot of times just like the stuff, like she'll be kind of in the mood for this, this, and this. I'll be like, I got you. I'm going to get it right now. Uh, yeah, little things, you know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, yeah. It's a it's a cliche, but I really feel like that's that's I've never experienced. My last relationship was terrible because that sacrifice wasn't made in a two way channel, and it definitely is a two way channel. And now that it is, I feel like it, I've really been able to be successful in ways that I wasn't before because of that. So uh, yeah, it, it really is uh, for anyone that is just like how is how is this gonna? It is the little things by uh, by beyond anything. It's the little things, it really is. Yeah. 
the notes, the hugs, the timeout. The, oh, you want to go? Okay. Uh, you want Mexican? Cool. In your own head. I, I don't want Mexican. But guess what? Yeah. Bet, babe, even, we're going to get Mexican. Or even just stuff like, oh, like you want to go out for the evening with so-and-so? You go get drinks? Let's go. Bye. I got the kids. Get out of here. Anytime. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. It's one of them stuff like that. Sure. Uh, I, I think honestly, that's like where I struggle with the most is just because, like I said before, you know, setting time aside to make sure that you dedicate, you know, you push out everything else for that couple hours and you're just worried about, you know, yeah. the two of you. you know, that's probably yeah. the most important thing. Right. Um, so, uh, kids, wife, now uh, talking about work, you said how. I do the same thing as well. Like I'll be at work on the forklift. I got the earbuds in, got the instrumental playing. I'm kind of rapping bullshit in my head, just kind of until something clicks. And then I'll remember to write it down, put my phone to later, whatever. It's just constantly going as you go. Cause I mean, what other time do we really have to write it dedicated anyway? So, um, all that going on, work can be stressful. You and I both have pretty high level intensity jobs. Uh, yeah. How do you, how do you keep that like motivation after that long? I mean, 12 hours, I do eight, you do 12. That's nuts. So, uh, like to be able to take that four or five hours sleep and get up, go, okay, I, I got to do this now. Like, is that motivation kind of natural for you or do you have to really kind of dig well, deep and, and grab that? Nah, I mean, sometimes I get kind of like, for example, like I said, like I tend to be more creative on night shift, but like I do, I do night shift now, like six weeks at a time. And then I switch back to daylight. Uh, like I know when I'm getting toward the end of that six weeks, I'm just kind of like, Oh, so you live in Alaska. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, yeah, it just, it's one of them things. It, I just, I wake up and like, that's what I want to do. Right. You know, some people, and I don't know what it's like for other people. Um, I know like if it comes to writing and recording, I'm pretty, you know, like, let's do it. Yeah. Um, I know when it comes to like practicing, like if I know I have a show coming up, you know, there's something like if I get off work, I'm like, I'm not practicing tonight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Or if I'm on night shift, like that first day off, I call it zombie day. Uh, yeah, I ain't doing any, any, I might record, but like, I ain't going to practice and go full ham on a set. You know what I right. Mean? Right. Uh, yeah. It's, I think that's the benefit. I, one of the, one of the couple benefits I found of being a solo artist is, I mean, I was in a band. I have two piece even, but we had our own PA. We had our own equipment. You know, we hauled and maintenance everything. It was constant chaos, checklist, cables, pedals. Because, I mean, you go to a show and you don't have something. It, it could mean your entire set. You know, it was a lot of stress in keeping it. Literally, all I have to do now is make sure I have the right instrumentals on a USB drive and go. Yep. It's, it's, it's a lot less stressful, so I feel like I've been able to put more time into focusing on the on the music itself you know have you experienced this, the same thing kind of like i okay you play guitar for a while but in a you know is it just simpler overall is just a solo artist in general um i mean i'm not i've it's been years it's been, it's been five years since i've been a full band um it's about the same because nine stitch method we're only a two piece you know we use backing track um, I think one of the most stressful things for us and that, cause we, you know, we're pretty good at going over all of our stuff. I know there was one, there was two times we forgot something at a venue. The one that was bad was we used at the time we used Josh's, um, MacBook and it's old battery, you know, it was pretty much shit. It didn't last very long. You always had to keep it on the charger. Right. We forgot that charger one time at a venue. So we learned that mistake, you know, so we had to go on Amazon and order another one. We had to wait for that. Uh, there was one time I think we forgot, like we have a little black table we set the computer on to run, you know, run the tracks off of and whatnot. Right. Uh, I think, I think I forgot the table the one time, uh, at the, I want to say the hard rock cafe actually, uh, uh but for the most part, we're good with that. Um, where was, where were we going with that quote? What, what, what was the question again? <laughs> I'm just uh, scattered now. I'm sorry. Uh, it's all good. No, it was just it was more of like uh, it being overall easier as a solo artist compared to. Oh, you know, oh. Yeah. um, I look at it two different ways. Okay, so from a performance standpoint, I prefer to the full band. Like, right. uh, no, we're only me and Yeti are only a two piece. 
I prefer that dynamic versus the solo. Right. Uh, but when it comes to the writing and the recording, um, I love writing with Josh. Him and I, we pass the guitar back and forth. We write riffs. I always have fun doing vocals and writing for our stuff and passing ideas back and forth with him. Um, the problem that I have is that when you're working with somebody else, you know, obviously it takes more time and my brain just doesn't stop. Like we'll write an album and in my head, I'll be like, okay, like I'm not writing for a while because, you know, we need to focus on these and performing them. And, you know, we, we shouldn't even be worried about writing and recording for a while. But the next day, I'm already writing riffs. I'm already writing lyrics, you know. So being a solo artist, I can control my the pace right. of what I do. You know what right. I mean? Right. Uh, you, know, you know, like, I'll, they're, I'll go through spurts where I'll write 10, 15 songs without, you know, just boom, 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 boom. And then I'll go through a couple months where I have, you know, writer's block and whatnot. Right. Uh, but, yeah, like, in that perspective, you know, it's nice having that outlet to where I control the pace and I don't have to worry about you know, holding out to somebody. But I don't have to wait, you know, for somebody else to get their parts or, you know, meet me there to get the product done. Right, right. Um, going back to the label, um, we're getting close to about the hour mark, so uh, good take good time to uh, see what's going on with the label. Um, new releases, like the latest releases from all from everybody here at uh, BB. Oh, man, there's so many releases going out right now. It's crazy. Um. Okay, so Johnny Grimes dropped his second album, uh, The Chocolate Dynasty. That was in May. Morbid Psychosis released his debut EP, uh, Blood, Sweat, and Years, in March. Carcass, formerly of the East Coast Crazies, dropped his debut EP in March as well. Uh, I dropped my album, Departures, uh, April. And I already, I'll be doing a split EP with Beast on the Fallen later this year. I have that pretty much all done and in the book. I just got to wait back for their feedback. Whether I didn't know about that. That's exciting. I probably wasn't supposed to say anything about that. <laughs> 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 um, but I, yeah, I'm sitting on some singles. I'm working on more singles. Uh, cool. Just to kind of drip, drip. I'm going to start dropping tracks here soon. Yep. Um, I've been trying to keep it for myself. I've been trying to have something on myself to put out or make sure that I'm on a feature at least once a month. Right on. Um, there's always something from me coming out. Yeah. Um, JJ Hollow, um, he just released a new song called Fox here a couple weeks ago. Uh, I just got the master back for his newest song that him and I recorded at my place a couple weeks ago, and that turned out. <sighs> probably. I'm excited. I'm excited to hear that. You, you should be. I'll be real with you. That's probably the best track that that boy's ever put pen to paper and recorded. Like, it is fire, dude. He went all in on that. Um, our newest artist, Ben MC, he dropped his first EP. Uh, that's a pretty cool little slab of... He's, he's, in a, he's, in a, he's in a bunch of different places, that EP. He's got some new metal type stuff. He's got Apology is insane. Like, I'm a huge fan of Apology. I, yes, I've been jamming that shit. That hook is fire, man. Um, and uh, yeah, local well, local smokeout reviewed that, and he even pointed out that orgy feel. And I was just like, "You're right, yeah." yeah I just I couldn't put my finger on it. That that dude got it. That's very much he, what it felt like. Yes, he he's got songs where he's got them old old school new metal vibes, and he's got other yeah. songs. He sounds like Jelly Roll. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so yeah, Ben Ben's a cool dude. I'm excited to see you know what what his future with the company looks like. Uh, I was very, very happy to do that song with him too, as well. The demons. That was, that was an awesome song. Um, statistic statistics been dropped. Uh, I actually just talked to Rudy earlier today. Um, he's pretty much putting the final touches on his album. He's going to release it in the fall. I can't wait, dude. That awesome. dude is so talented. It's so clean. His engineering <laughs> and production quality is like, he's a boss. And he's and like he's got them cool like the perfect circle. Yes, like, Maynard, like, very Maynard yeah, sounding like, almost. Yeah. Yes, uh, he's just got that cool like prog rock type vibe. Yeah, and it's just super ambient and melodic at the same. time. He can get heavy and aggressive, but like he seems to be most comfortable 
and in his element when it's laid back and spacey. Right, you know, he's right, a right. Brilliant, brilliant songwriter. Um, Lost in the Mutiny, they're turning out. They're currently releasing a single. They're dripping their album, uh, one track every last Friday of every month. Uh, and I've heard a lot of them. You know, I've been friends with those guys for a long time. Uh, it's exciting to see them finally putting this material out and to be a part of that. Um, awesome. Great dudes. Oh, God. Uh, let's see. Freddie Webbs will be dropping a track. <laughs> I'm excited for this Freddie Webbs track. Freddie come over here and recorded it with me. We had a lot of fun. We pushed him to his limits to try to get the you know best takes we could out of him. It, it, it's a really, really fun song. Um, that'll be coming out later this month. Uh, oh, what else? You're working on your album. You just released yep. Shadowville. Yep, with you. We're then we're, you know we're you know you're going to be releasing your new album here within uh, probably before the end of the year. Yeah, I would say, yeah, definitely. I would, uh, maybe maybe at this point, probably around like you know spooky time, maybe. Yeah. And we we gotta I gotta give this dude a shout out. Kill the noise. Yes. We'll be dropping a mixtape featuring a bunch of people along with his debut album. I can't including me. It's gonna I'm I'm freaking excited for that. Kill the I, noise. I've heard a few things off of that and I'm just like, my guy, what did you do? <laughs> it's so good. It's so yeah, good. Kill is Kill is definitely a boss. Uh all right, hold on. Let me make sure I didn't forget anybody here. Yep. Lord knows there's a lot of them. Lost in the Me, or not Lost in the Me. Skies of Terror, they're working on a new single. Um, they released um, World Collide back like right at the beginning of the new year, yep. which that was, a, that was a great step for them in terms of songwriting and production and whatnot. Them guys are, them guys are awesome. Shout out uh, Last of a Dying Breed, too, because uh, they've been working on Several things, including my music video. So, yes, yes. Uh, I think that's all we got right now on the artist front. Cool. Uh, other aspects of the label as well. We got the stream team and the Babes of Brutal Business. What's going on there? Uh, stream team. We just announced we're doing the four fourteenth and the fifteenth of Ju uh, July for the first streaming event of the year. We had a really, really good year with that last year. I think we raised a uh, little over 2K for the Children's Miracle Network. So yeah. the thing's kind of going. And that was with COVID. So who knows what's going to happen this year. Um, right. I'm hoping to have another good year because we did. That was the best year for that by far. Since I've been on, from going off of what Cody has told me. That's the right. most we've ever raised for it. Uh, shout out to him too, dude, because he, he put his heart and soul into that. Campaign Cody is very passionate about what he does, and he's very good at what he does. Yes, yes, I can't take any credit for that. He that boy puts in the work for that. He does something yeah. amazing every time. Uh that's what's going on for the stream team, the Gruesome Gazette. Them guys, uh, dude, they put out great content and articles on the daily. They're so Shout good. Out Anthony, he's he's, he's good, Anthony, great, Anthony great, and Mike, Anthony yes. and Mike are both and great. Mike, yes. And what's really cool about that, too, is people are starting to send them scripts to review and whatnot, which is another awesome. thing. Whenever, like, the horror cons and whatnot start coming back, they want to get out there. And, you know, once that stuff really, really starts coming back, it, just off of the talk that I've had with Anthony, you're really going to start to see that start to branch out and grow. Awesome. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, those he guys, deserves it too. He works really, really hard for that stuff. Yeah, those guys bust their asses, dude. Like they, like I oh, said, yeah. always, always stick to the schedule and always make sure they have content to push, man. And like honestly, I didn't really know about it until I got the label a year ago. And by themselves, without really ever being promoted, like just doing the horror movie reviews, you know, they racked up almost a thousand likes and stuff on facebook by themselves with constant engagement and whatnot you know awesome yeah yeah they know they know what they're doing they got it down you know uh it, it's been pretty cool to see and watch that grow and expand into what it's becoming and they got some really really cool stuff on the way awesome. uh we the models um we have a, we're going down this saturday actually we're heading on to west virginia to work with jen from uh nightmares and dreams photography we're doing a pride month shoot which is cool because, you know, the girls have a lot of cool ideas for that. And Cassandra has a whole line 
a fragile a pride jewelry made up for that that they're going to be using and you know showing off as well so I, i'm excited for that you know, awesome. we, uh, we just added a new babe didn't we new yeah drew, drew Lux and a potential new model might be coming down she should be coming down we don't know if she's going to join yet but she's, she's going to kind of test the water cool so uh That's they got exciting. they got a bunch of cool other shoots and stuff planned throughout the rest of the year so it's just, it's, it, it all kind of goes back to really seeing where it's looking like things are going back to normal. Right. Consistently, you know, at least. Yeah. Consistently. You know, this this summer, I I believe, is really going to be a test as to what goes on with that. Especially, too, like for freedom for us, musicians, you know, like touring packages are starting to come back. Right. Uh, like we just landed Twisted. Um, yep. Crazies are opening up for head PE. Head P and Dropout Kings. You're opening up for Dropout, Dropout Kings. Kings. Yep. And, uh, Nine Six Method. We have our first show back with Prime Eight. That'll be next weekend as well. Um, and then we oh, got some other. I'm Go also ahead. opening up for Razakel in September. Yeah, uh, it's Raz. Me, you, the Crazies, the Morbid Dakotas. Yep. For Razakel. Um, yep. There's a couple, there's a couple totally others, but I don't, I don't want to say it until I get the date. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. been pushed off the night. Right. I get my hopes up, like it's finally happening. Yep. Nope. Yep. Yep. But yeah, think, shows, are, shows are starting to come back, so that's exciting in itself. Yeah, I think we'll hopefully be able to see a little more consistency and be able to at least, you know, announce more things as as time passes. So. Well, uh, getting to the end of the close of everything. So, is there anything you want to like give as advice uh, to kind of formulate the whole rhetoric of you know how we make this mad life work? Uh, it's craziness. Um, the best I can say is always communicate if you have a partner. Um, keep a check on your mental health too. Sometimes you ha you know. We all have deadlines and whatnot, but sometimes you got to be like, I need a break. Uh, learn your limitation, you know, like learn to say, you know, okay, enough's enough. I need to, uh, and just at the end of the day, stay humble, work hard, don't cut corners. And by that, I mean, make sure you have a decent product to push. Don't be buying views or any shit like that, you know, uh, just, don't break the rule of the universe. Don't be a dick. Uh, <laughs> so, just keep close to the grindstone and stay humble, man. Yeah. You know, if you do, if you do that, you know, you, nothing, nothing. Especially in this industry, yeah, there's sometimes where there's flash in the pan successes, but you have to respect a slow grind. You know, like a a good slow grind. You know that it takes its time. You know where you put in the work and build the foundation with. Right, because I'm, cause nothing's guaranteed in this industry at all. Yeah, it's true. And another thing, too, always, let, you know, and, and this is a pot calling Kettle Black here, always learn to stop, look around, and appreciate what you have going on in the now. Yes. You know, we have, we have tunnel vision. We're working towards this and this and this. But oftentimes we don't, you know, it's not until months later, I, I you know, I'll sit down and I'll be like, man, I really did that. You know, like, I, I got to do that. That was really, you know, learn to really relish them moments and cherish them moments. You know what I mean? Because Lord knows that the clock doesn't stop. It just keeps going. and We don't get it back. That's it. And that's a huge reason why I want to do this podcast. Why I have people like you on here? Because we, I, I have the same mindset, you know, and people I feel like with this mindset have the greatest chance for success in any given environment because it's persistent. It's, it's constant work being able to like learn from your mistakes you have to know when to quit and by quit i mean slow down like you said you know what i mean give it a break and and really give credit to people that help make you better and give you the opportunity to do the stuff that we do that we wouldn't normally do without them exactly and you know another thing too i think that needs to be said is you know this goes back to we all have a goal right don't don't judge or don't compare your success 
or form your idea of success off of what your peers are doing around you. You know, like, because every every person, everything is different, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, yeah, like, make, don't be jealous because that person got that show or they got this opportunity, that opportunity. Because a lot of times you don't know what they went through or how hard they had to hustle to get them opportunities. And chances are a lot of times, too, you know, uh, you know, the people have been around, you know, like, like, for example, Steve's. In MacBlock, like Steve hasn't been around very long. Worst is where you've been grinding for how long you've been doing MacBlock now? Four years now. Four years. Okay, so like you know, in a, in it's not always this case, but in a lot of ways, like you know, I shouldn't be jealous because you're getting this and this and this opportunity. Right. You, you kind of get what I'm saying. Absolutely, and I think you and I, we both experience both sides of that coin. Is you know, for me personally, when I sit and see someone doing, I have to be like. That's awesome. Good for them. Because in that moment, I no longer care to compare myself. You're happy for them. Be happy for them. Support yeah. your friends. Support people around. Because then, bam, it's it turns into inspiration. You know, it's it's not like this nagging, biting thing in the back of your skull going, man, you're not, you're not, you're not there, man. You just you don't have that's why they got it, not you. You can't you can't do that to yourself. You really have to support your friends, your peers around you, and be happy for them so that your mind is almost clear to say. All right, it, I, you don't you don't bring yourself down over their success. You uplift yourself because of it. It becomes inspiration. Or yeah, that and, and even just like like that should be me, not them. That right. should be me. This is, you know because it goes back to you know one everybody's music is subjective. Right. I don't care who you are. Absolutely, all of, us, all of us as musicians doesn't matter how humble you are. We all think our stuff is the shit. Yeah, but it, it goes back to you know. You don't know what they had to go through to get them opportunities. You don't know how long they've been hustling to get them opportunities. Right. Right. So it's just, you know, keep, you know, be happy for those around you, you know, and if you're feeling jealous, you know, turn that negativity into motivation. Positive. Right. Right. Push, push, push. That's, that's a, that's a big thing because even Absolutely. like myself, I, I know, I know we're past the hour mark here. Like, I don't, I, really I, don't care, but... I, I don't know about you. As in, like for me, like I'll go through spurts where I'm like, I feel like I'm a shit. Like, yeah, I'm on fire. I can conquer everything. I'll be like that for a couple of weeks and then I'll just hit like a wall and I'll be like, man, dude, you are ass. Oh my God. Absolutely. Why are you even doing this? Yes. <laughs> yes. You, know? yeah. Yeah, you get them weird little seasons, you know, it just, it, it all comes back to learning how to take that negativity and turn it into positive. Right. So for me, when I battle that, I think I posted about this a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I don't care about the hour mark, to be honest with you. Um, so I had to go back and listen. Okay. I, you, you can revisit your own music as much as you want, but I purposely listened to it on my Spotify channel. It wasn't like get my own plays up. It was like to look and go, I'm literally on fucking Spotify right now. Like that's, mm -hmm. As, as oversaturated as that market is, it's still a huge milestone for me personally. And I always <laughs> constantly let that be a accomplishment of mine that I remind myself of. Because once you start getting complacent, you start getting that deeper mindset of you're not going anywhere. Why are you doing this? Right. It doesn't – you know, no. You need to appreciate those small moments of I'm literally on fucking spot. I have two albums on Spotify and I have another single and I have this. You know what I mean? R remind yourself that – and that's how I bring myself out of that – why, why the fuck are you even doing this? You know, I don't have big numbers. You don't have big numbers. We, it's not about that. And there, it's, we have to remind ourselves that our shit is really good. Dude, I, to this day, Shadowville is going to be my top song for a while. It's just, it's, was, it's great, man. A, a, a similar kind of, a little different. I went through, uh, it would have been a couple of weeks ago now. Um, Nine Stitch Method, when we put out Life After You. We did. We recorded that all ourselves, mixed and mastered it, you know. And that was whenever, like, we started getting album reviews. We started getting on podcasts and radio stations. We started getting uh, shows off of that. That was what started getting pushed around. I was up in bed. I was still on night shift. I was up in bed. I couldn't sleep, and I listened to that fucker from front to back. And I texted Josh. Oh my God! Why did you let me put this out? <laughs> 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 I was like, 
I was like, oh my god, this is dog shit. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? But it kind of, but you know, like what you were saying though. You, you know, I listen to what we've been working on and what we have worked on in the last couple of years versus where we were then and seeing the progression and whatnot, you know, so that's, how you can, can you not the, be proud of that when you hear exactly. yourself? You know what I mean? That's exactly. that. If that isn't motivation, then you need to stop. Eventually, obviously you've lost your passion for it. If you haven't listened to what progression you've made and you, if you do that, you can't go, all right, I am the shit. Then just walk away. At that point, you've lost your passion for it. Well, <laughs> me and Gus, when we were, uh, when me and Gus were working on putting the final touches for our album, the soft clarity, <laughs> we, I think we fought over for a couple months. He wanted to put out like every track that we'd done to that date in the last three years. And I was like, no, I was like, <laughs> those songs from three years ago are dog shit. Don't do that. Yeah. To <laughs> you know, then he was just like, you singer, you're so you're so you're so critical of yourself these songs are awesome we need to put them out i'm like no like only put the ones that we've done since like 2019 yeah you know and he he won that argument i think we put all of them on except for one i think we took one of them off uh (laughs) you know but yeah yeah just take negativity turn it into positivity and if you think you sound like shit do what you got to do to put the work in and make yourself yeah. better to where you're happy with it. Right. Do you, do you have a clear path as like your end game? Like where do you see Patrick McElravey or brutal business or seed or nice this method? Like where is there an end game for you? Do you see yourself being a specific place or are you just like, you know what? Let's just do the damn thing. Bro, I'm riding by the seat of my pants every step of the way. <laughs> <laughs> my boy. Well, I mean, well okay, let me, let me, I'll put it to you this way. So me and Josh started, Not This Method was my first venture into being a vocalist full time. Yep. And, you know, we did it. It was like, okay, this is cool. We're doing this. Josh was the one that booked that. Josh just randomly one day was like, oh, by the way, I booked our first show. I was like, <laughs> you what? We don't even have a full band. Yeah, because at that point, I never done, you know, the two man band format we have now. That's how yeah. Josh's little band was. I never, you know, I was oh, like, gotcha. full band, full band mentality, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was like, hey, I booked our first show. Uh, you know, I remember them for that. For, oh, man, those first couple of shows were rough. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, but it went from that to uh, starting to play. Uh, the uh, shows like Rodrowski and whatnot opening up for national headliner or, you know, national acts. Then it was playing out of state, you know, traveling and whatnot, you know, and then people actually digging the shit, buying the shit, sharing the shit. Uh, hell, even like with me doing Steve over the last several months playing shows for that, you know, everyone's been like, is my a little thing? I'm like, oh yeah, it's very much still a thing. It's just COVID. That's all. You know, right, right. Yeah, but uh, you know, um, like we've been on FM radio, uh, bunch of online podcast. Um, we'll be, uh, I'll plug us in there too, since we're on here. Uh, nine stitch method and C's will both be in the book, a definitive guide to new metal coming out, uh, in fall. Uh, that it's kind of like a biography about, you know, the, starting of new metal with like horn death tones and all that jazz and then they kind of go from that into a lot of the new racks that are you know carrying the torch you know you got bands like tala i know you love them tala absolutely uh, heart sick heart sick another amazing one oh my god they're good um redefine crossed paths uh you know the list goes on there's a plethora of them and the fact that somehow Myself and my, you know, me and Yeti, even got in that. Like, that's got to be mind blowing, man. It is because, like, like I know we're good, but like I know how, you know, especially because even from a numbers perspective and you know just accomplishment wise, like them guys are all touring and what you know. I, I don't know. It's just, it's just weird. But at the same time, it's like, hey, that's us. You know, so yeah. When you get when you get opportunities like that, you know, you kind of take them moments and see the moments, enjoy it. Yeah. 
I mean, it, it, it's it's like mind blowing in myself as as I'm a, kind of experiencing the same thing that I can literally tell people the the guy that runs my label is in the same book mentioned talk about as like corn and right? mushroom head and so like. That's insane, and, and I'm sitting here talking to the guy that isn't a book about that shit. Like that's yeah. that that's what keeps me motivated. It's it's like I'm I'm where right now with the, with these guys. Okay, I do a song with Kill It Noise, and I'm like, I did with that. Wow. All right. Yeah. Let's. So, all right. I'm just kind of beside myself at all times. So and I'm. I think that's a huge motivator to keep going. You know what I mean? It's yeah. I've never experienced this level of. I, I'm even going to say success because I'm still doing music progressively more and better than I've ever done before. And so are you, you know, that's, that's, that's progression. That's, that's con- Yeah. It's a constant climb. Every song I do is 10 times better than the last and how we managed to do that amidst insanely hard jobs. I have kids. You have kids. We have women to keep happy. We have our sanity to keep in check. Now, how, how do your kids do with with their dad being a musician? Okay, this is this is a good topic. So, um, they the four older ones have actually formed their own little band called the Seasons. So, um, 12, 11, 12, 11, uh, <laughs> 10, and seven are the f- four oldest, yeah. and they've realized all their birthdays kind of fall in a different season of the year. One of the four, all of them, which is it's yeah. cool. So. And they've always been interested in watching me play. And my my two older kids have, have watched me since they were little. You know, I've seen them music and they've seen me play. And I've always recorded my own footage. So I'm studying my own film and doing these things to try and all encompassing, trying to, you know, hone in on my craft. And uh, they want to do their own film company now. So they're always like, oh, dad, what are you doing this weekend? Can we borrow the camera? Can we use your, your light? Because we're doing a film. And it's just like mind blowing, you know, it, they may have not been like right into music right away. And, you know, they need to learn to play instruments, but the idea of them getting a band, I have a, you know, a keyboard synth player here for my, my beats and production stuff. They're dead. How do we, can I use that? Like, yeah, check this out, press this button. And then they just instantly you watch that like moment wash over them of like, this is so fucking cool. And they're just playing. It, it's to watch it motivate them in their own way is super cool. Um, they, they're never really annoyed with it other than like me having to listen to my own shit a thousand times to like make my own beats. And by the time I release the album, they're like, yeah, we've heard this a thousand fucking times. Dad. You know what I mean? So like, that's the only downside, but I got to recently take them to Pittsburgh a few times. Um, shout out uh, Megan and Joe uh, to their house to do various projects for mad clock stuff. The video uh, Bella Rotten's going to be dancing for me on stage, performing with me. And they got to see what I do and travel and, and do kind of the thing inclusively with them. And it's made it so much easier for them to accept it when I get to include them as much as I possibly can. Anytime I have an all ages show, I take the kids. Um, obviously, some aren't. They can't take them. It's whatever. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, Xavier, uh, you've seen Zave on camera and talk to him and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, he, we went to a show my buddy Matt and I made called uh, Sunday Couch Slaughter. And we had a couch donated to us from a church. And we got to destroy it on stage and let all the crowd like to tear it to pieces. And just, it was a mess. And uh, I got to play on stage in front of him for the first time. And he was really kind of mesmerized. And he was like with the other guys, like throwing this couch around and shit. Well, it ended up hitting him in the head. And like, it kind of fell on him a little bit before it was like totally broke up, you know? So I get off, (laughs) I go to the side stage to go get behind the curtain. And uh, this one girl in the show is like bringing him up and he's holding his head. I'm like, what the fuck happened? Like, oh my God, I'm dead. Like, the first time I take my kid to a show, he gets hurt. This is never going to happen again. Like, you know, and uh, he just, yeah, he took it like a champ though. Um, he got to like jump off the stage and jump on the couch. He had a blast. So including them has been a, a ton of fun. Yeah. So uh, what do you do? Lorelai and, and dude, they're all. Lorelai like, and Jackson. You know, okay. So my, my son, he has, he has like sensory issues. Like okay. he doesn't like loud noises. Right. Um, so there's like two parts to it. So if I'm in the attic practicing, whether it be non-stitch method or C's, he doesn't like that. It's typically best for him to be outside playing yep. where it's not really loud. But like I was getting ready for my last show, the C's show, and I was running through my set, and he was just like, Daddy, 
shut up. <laughs> I've had enough. I can't take it. Shut up. So, but like you get him in the car and this is pretty cool. Like you get him in the car here and he's like, daddy, turn on one of your rock star songs. Daddy, turn on one of your and uncle Josh's song. Um, so like, that's always pretty cool. Um, yeah. my daughter's pretty much the same way. Like, a lot of times, like when we do shows and stuff, um, our friend Sarah or my sister-in-law, she'll watch the kids. If we do like a live feed from Facebook, the one time, I think it might have been when we opened up for Hinder. Uh, yeah, that would have been, I believe it would have been Hinder. We opened up for Hinder and like my sister-in-law got a video of the kids watching it on her laptop and they were like moshing around in the, you know, <laughs> in the living room and whatnot. That was cool. Yeah. Uh, both kids love music. They both can, um, they both can kind of sing. Like they, they know enough listening and like, they actually like can hit the notes and stuff like that. So that's kind of yeah. cool to see them skills kind of develop. Um, yeah. uh, my daughter, very, very artsy, uh, loves to draw and stuff like that. So I'm kind of, my son likes to walk around with the, he's only four and a half. So like he, he's still a little young yet to kind of see my daughter. I can definitely see doing something with music in the future. She's already talking to me. She's like, daddy, like when are we going to go up to the attic? When are we going to do a song? I want right. to do this song, you know? So I'm like, all right, all right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. The, I, I would, I would say the coolest moment for me, um, Every time I make an album, I have, okay, so one, two, I always have to count. One, two, three. So the three albums I have, and then Devil Never, Devil's Never Cry releases eventually. i will be a fourth one. They always ask for a copy. Dad, I got to have a copy because I make hard copies. It's kind of a, as you know, not a big of a thing anymore because it's all digital, but I still love having hard copies. Likewise. So I always have to have one. They make me sign it. It's like, oh, if Dad ever gets rich, we're going to you know make money off Dad. So I'm like, yeah, you know, pay away to college if I ever make it. That'd be dope, you know? Um, I walked by the stairs the one day and legit, I bought Zave like a, just a, a boom box. He loves 21 pilots. He loves Lincoln park. I'm deadly. He's been dying for me to take him to a 21 pilots, um, show, but I walked by and he's playing my album, like just nonchalantly in his room and jamming to it. And I'm just like, get oh. the fuck out of here, man. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, we're, uh, we have like designated cleaning days in the house. You know, we all have to pitch in. It's a big house. A lot of people. I have six kids, for those of you who don't know, or probably figured out by listening by now. I say it all the time. Um, so uh, they're downstairs. We're upstairs doing our thing. And yeah, they're cleaning to music. And they threw the whole album in and they're just listening to the track after track while dad's. And I, Tara's like, What do you, are they serious? I'm like, Yeah, they're playing my album down there. I just, just stood at the top of the stairs for like 10 minutes just listening. And they were like singing along the parts of it, like, some of my stuff's vulgar, but they know not to swear, and they're pretty good about it. And they'll get to a part, and they just get really quiet, and wait for Dad to stop swearing, and they keep going. <laughs> but uh, it's super cool. It's just mind blowing to watch. It just that was my moment of like, holy shit! It's really cool. What I think, what I think kind of got gets me the most sometimes is like, for example, the the features and the collab, like. They don't hear the songs like with me and Josh passing the guitar back and forth. You know, they don't hear that right. a thousand times. Right. You know, and a lot of times, like, them songs are recorded while they're sleeping or they're in school or whatever. Right. But, like, if I put it on, they'll hear it. They'll be like, oh, that's you, Daddy. I'm like, you're goddamn right, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's kind of cool. You know, yeah. and that they recognize. Yeah, yeah it's, it makes you, it, it's, it's like a proud moment, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's really cool. Uh, they've been dying. You know, I, I tell them all these show dates I have coming up. Because recently, I've been booked for a lot of really cool shows. A couple I can't even announce yet. And it's like, Dad, can we go to that one? What about this one? What about because I we make a chart. And we you know, we have to like set dates aside so we know communication. As you said, you have to make sure we have time and dates and money for yep, all this yeah, stuff. We got, a, we got a calendar in the dining room. Yep. It's like, oh, what about this date, Dad? Okay, what about that one, Dad? What about that one, Dad? That I'm like, ah. I got to see, honey. If they're all ages, I will take you or one of the ones like, I mean, yeah. am I going to take six kids to a show at once? I think not. It's just not feasible. You know what I'm saying? Like, but well, I mean, like, that's I rotate them. It's time, well, <laughs> even now, but like, as time goes on, maybe they get right. a little older. Right. It might, it might not be such an, well, I guess that depends right. on your, all your merch and your setup. Yeah, and yeah for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, at, you know, it's that's, not just go to a show and play. That's a lot to haul. Right. Know, just, 
up and normal, let alone go into a show. Absolutely. It's the table, the T-shirts, this, that, the hard drive, the this, and then, oh, yeah, let's worry about four or five, six kids too. Cool. So, yeah. Um, I took Zave the one time, like I said, he had a blast. And then now all the kids like, well, Zave got to go. I'm like, I'm, he's the oldest out of all y'all, except for my oldest daughter, Alicia. Uh, but she's like, you're taking me next. I'm like, yes, honey. Yes, yes. And they – Partially because they want to see their dad play live, but mostly because they just want to experience that. And that's what's really cool is they just want to experience that environment. And I think it's really cool to, you know, put them somewhere they've just never been. And, and then they can say, like, wow, that was – it'll motivate them in some kind of way. It's got to do something to them, for them. You know what I mean? It's it's something they've never experienced before. And seeing how people come together, even watching a mosh pit, now they're not all violent. You know, those dudes that get run over to pick you up and – Make sure people are okay. As soon as they've got hurt, like everyone just put the couch down and picked him up and made sure he was okay and shit, you know, and he got his revenge on the couch. He got to rip the arm off it completely. So it's, it's really cool just watching all that stuff. It just makes me really proud to be a dad. Yeah. Well, man, it's, it's been super fun talking to you. We're about an hour and 24 in. It's really been that long. Yeah, yeah. It it's crazy. I, it doesn't feel like that long at all. I as you know, you and I could talk for hours. We have done plenty of times before. <laughs> yes, sir. This is yeah. very true. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Guilty as charged. Well, I do severely and, and immensely appreciate you coming on the show. Um, it's been great Thank getting you all me. your – absolutely. It's been great getting all your knowledge and experience, and that's what I want to build this podcast with is full of knowledge and experience for people to find it and go, wow, so someone else can do it. It, it is very much possible. It takes it takes a lot, but perseverance and cooperation and communication, it's more than capable of being done. Absolutely. So everybody watching, thank you very much. This has been episode three of the Mad Life podcast. Thank you to Patrick McElravey of BBE, of Seed, of Nine Stitch Method, of my boss, of one of the coolest dudes I've ever met. Thank you very much, man. Much love, brother. Yep. You take it easy now, right? Until next time, Mad Clock out.